So welcome everybody to today's session uh, on behalf of IDF. Very glad to have you here today. Uh, this is a diagnosis di diagnosis specific session on Viscott Aldrich syndrome. I am Sumati Iyengar, and all of you here know me, so I'm not going to introduce myself. I will be the moderator for this session. Before we begin, please remember that each individual's treatment and condition is unique. The information presented during this session is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider with questions regarding your specific medical condition at that time. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box and we'll go over the questions. Dr. Kindati will be looking at the questions as well. I can look at the questions too and we'll answer, Dr. Kindati will answer as many questions as is possible. Um, as we, uh, ah, here we go, people are trickling in. So as we usually do for our sessions, we'd like to start off with a family story. And Amy McNally has been very kind today to share her story. And Amy McNally is a good friend of mine for a very long time. She's also a director on the board of the Wiscott Aldrich Foundation. Welcome, Amy. Okay, thank you. Thanks for asking me to share um, our son's story. Um, I'm Amy McNally, and I'm um, a, a board member of the Wiscott Aldrich Foundation. Um, I have a 17-year-old son. Um, his name is David, and um, we are from the Bay Area, California. Um, I'm married to Michael, and we have four children. Um, we have two girls and two boys. Um, David is our middle son, and he was born with a common Wiscott Aldrich um, mutation, um, making his symptoms mild. Um, he had bloody diarrhea, um, low platelets, um, petechiae, and bruising. Um, he did not have eczema or infections. Um, he had a unrelated bone marrow transplant in 2006 at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California, when he was two years old. Um, he still has his spleen, and um, before his transplant, he never had IVIG um, transfusion or blood transfusions. Um, I am not a Wiscott Aldrich um, carrier. Um, I had a spontaneous mutation inside of my egg. Um, it was very difficult for the doctors to diagnose David uh, because all he had was bloody diarrhea at the time and petechiae and low platelets. Um, he was finally diagnosed at one year old and it seemed like that took forever. Um, he um, was had to have several blood draws and tests were sent out and there's a period of waiting about six weeks before a result would come back. And um, we did this on and off for months until we finally got a diagnosis of Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Um, the diagnosis was very shocking. Um, and we had a consultation with our doctors at Stanford and they became frantic and wanted to transplant him immediately. Um, they did not have very many Wiscott patients, and the one that they had had um, died of a brain hemorrhage. Um, so they did not want to risk losing another patient. Um, we left that consultation and went home to think about it. Um, we did not know if there were any other options for us. And like I said, it was pretty shocking. Um, shocking mainly because David at that point didn't really show any symptoms. Um, he was, you know, starting to crawl. He had some bruising here and there, but no infections. He did not appear sick. Um, and I stayed up night after night. Um, at that time, I had a seven-year-old daughter and a six-year-old daughter, um, and I'm a stay-at-home mom, and um, I stayed up on the internet. So this is in 2005 
where there wasn't a lot of information on the internet um, about Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Um, and I combed through as best as I could, as best as my research skills could lead me on the internet. And um, I finally came across a primary immunodeficiency message board that was very old. And a woman on that board, um, some of you know her as Rosalind, um, she had posted a message even years before 2005 that said her son had Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to try and contact her and see if she'll respond. It, it would be very unusual for her to respond on an old message board. Her email was probably old too, and she would never get the message. So I thought, well, what can I, what, what do I have to lose? So I messaged her and she responded immediately, which was really shocking too. Um, it turns out that she also lived five minutes from me. Um, and so she was very willing to come over and um, counsel me as a Wiscott mom. Her son had Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. He did not have a transplant at Stanford. And she gave me lots of research reports and basically was very encouraging to me and said, here you go. Here's a pile of research reports please get in touch with Dr. Kandati at the National Institute of Health and Dr. Ox, um, wh who works in Seattle and consult with them too. So that's what I did. Um, and um, we also reached out to some other Wiscott survivors, um, the parents, um, one of those being Sumanthi and Bob Mahoney. Um, and, um, thank you so much for your encouragement during those really hard times. Um, we, um, after I had spoken with, I wanted to mention this, I've mentioned this before, but um, when I spoke with Mr. Dr. Ox, um, there was one thing that he said to me, he's like, you know, I don't mind speaking to you because it's asking him lots of questions, but I think you have too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, so that to me was an indication that I was doing the best job that I could as David's advocate and as his mother um, to make the best decision for him. Um, and so we decided to go back to Stanford and let them know that we did not want to transplant David, that we were just going to treat his symptoms as they came up. Um, and we thought we could manage that. Um, as time went by, um, not much more time, but as a few months went by, we had lots of bleeds. He would hit his mouth and we would have to treat that. I was also into nutrition and health and I would reach out to others who would give me nutrition advice to help his platelets. And so I was just doing my best. But um, one afternoon we went over to a friend's house and all of our kids were jumping on the trampoline together. And at that time, David had his little helmet on and to protect his head from any injuries. Um, and we went home that evening and everything was fine. But the next morning he woke up and was vomiting. And shortly after, I thought he had a stomach flu uh, because we we're around other children. Um, but then as time went on that day, um, his lips started to turn blue and it was really obvious to me that something serious was wrong. Um, and so we rushed him to the ER and we found out that he, all, he had a brain bleed. Um, and so he was in the hospital for about, a, a week total as they were treating him with transfusions and um, keeping him sedated um, in order to keep his, um, his brain from moving around and so that he could heal. Um, and in that time, we had a discussion with the Stanford doctors and they had a very heart to heart discussion with us to um, transplant him. And um, that was a very hard, hard decision to make. Um, 
David's platelets were fairly good. Um, they were about 25,000. So you wouldn't think that he would be at risk for a brain bleed, but he's a boy and um, we are a very active family. Um, we're physically active. We travel a lot. Um, and I just thought that I, this is something that you can't treat. Um, if you don't do something um, that he could have brain damage for the rest of his life and be a vegetable. And um, that was nothing that we wanted to put upon him. And so that, that was our choice. And so we went ahead and agreed to have the transplant. Um, we were, um, we didn't have a sibling match. And so um, there were several adult males actually that he had a 10 to 10 match with, um, which was amazing. Um, out of those, someone did volunteer and um, he had a 10 to 10 match with a, a young adult male. Um, we still don't know who that person is. Um, we've tried to reach out, but they, they don't have an interest in meeting us. Um, so who knows, maybe one of these days, if I keep trying, we might be able to, I don't, I don't know though. Um, so we go through a transplant, which was very um, complicated. Um, his donor was a different blood type. Um, and we also opted, we were given a choice to do a traditional transplant versus a low intensity transplant, um, which means that you have less chemotherapy. And we chose the low intensity transplant in order to possibly preserve his fertility. Um, he, because of that, there were risks that we knew that we were taking, one being his engraftment. Would he engraft? Would he engraft at all? That's, that's the biggest risk when you do a low intensity transplant. Um, and if you do engraft, it's going to usually take a long time. So it could take 30 to 40 days. And that's what happened with David. Um, about on day 40 is when we got the results that he actually did engraft. So he had a, um, a successful transplant. Um, but with that engraftment, um, we, he also had graft versus host disease. Um, and also the different blood type meant that he had to receive many transfusions, um, blood transfusions. Um, so that went on for months until he, his body finally transitioned to this new blood type, which is amazing. Um, and so with the graft versus host disease, um, he had it on his skin, um, which was very severe. Um, he was on medications and transfusions and hospital stays. And because he was immunosuppressed because of the graft versus host disease, um, he had several um, infections um, and including sepsis. Um, so he did not have any liver graft versus host disease or gut or lung, um, which are very common with transplants. Um, and um, he was on steroids for a very long time. So he had stunt of growth. His cholesterol was out the roof. Um, he wasn't growing. Um, he, he was very sick for seven years. And all of a sudden, he started getting better. We don't know what it was, but his body, something in him just started working and his graft versus host disease on his skin just started slowly disappearing. Not slowly. It actually happened pretty quickly once it started. Um, and when I say quickly, it was just a like a few months. Um, it, it was clearing up. It would come back in little patches, but not nearly as bad as what he had all over his body. Um, and 
they they tell me that um, that can happen, um, usually not seven years down the line. <laughs> Um, so why it happened so late, I don't know. Um, and he's doing great now. Um, those years were really hard on our family. Um, my, um, my husband worked full time and I was David's main caretaker along with our other two girls. And my husband needed to stay employed. So we had the insurance. And so I just, I would get up with David all the time. I would take him to the hospitals. We had family, not really family, but friends that would take care of my girls when we had hospital stays with David. Um, but we actually, <laughs> um, the doctors didn't like this, um, but we traveled a lot in between all of these episodes. And we kept our lives as normal as possible. Um, traveling was a big risk um, because of sickness, because of possible hospital stays. And when I mean travel, I mean, we traveled. We traveled overseas um, and we tried to keep our lives as normal as possible. And in between these trips, um, is when he would have these hospital stays, but during our trips, for some reason, he would be doing great. Um, we never had to visit a hospital while we, while we were overseas. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I don't encourage other people to do that, but um, I do encourage, try to encourage people to live a normal life as possible um, to realize that you don't need to live in a bubble in your house like we've had to live these past couple years with COVID um, that you can think of ways to keep activity, keep your family active and keep, especially the patient um, moving um, and hydrated and good things like that. Um, let's see. Okay, um, one thing I wanted to point out is that um, he had a side effect of Hashimoto thyroiditis, which is um, the thyroid problem um, due to the chemotherapy. And um, he was on medications, which is not, there aren't really bad side effects with um, levothyroxine, which is the thyroid medication. Um, and so he, he's been on the same dose for many years now. Um, and recently his endocrinologist decided to take him off of levothyroxine to see how he would do because he's gone through puberty and it looks like that he might have peaked for his growth. And she thought, you know, let's try this. He's been on the same dose of 50 milligrams for years and I, we, we agreed that that would be a good idea to get him, get him off of a medication. And so um, we took him off of it about three months ago and he's been fine. His um, thyroid numbers have all been stable. Um, and so we're very thankful for that. Um, another thing that David has that's not transplant related or Wiscott related is he has a hole in his heart. Um, it's very tiny. And it's in an area where, where it probably will not close because it's not muscular. Um, it's a little bit, it's in the septum of his heart and it's a little bit in the muscle, but it's mostly above it. Um, and so um, the doctors are just watching him and he just recently saw the cardiologist and they said, that they would like to see him in a couple of years. So he's doing fine and he's stable with that. Um, he is a very active yeah, uh, teenager, 17. He's going to be getting his driver's license pretty soon. And he's, he's active um, in martial arts. He's almost has his black belt. Um, he's amazingly physically strong. We just went out last night to practice softball. Um, he's never really played softball much and I have played. And so I thought that would be fun. And he, he hit this ball 
out of the park. He is just amazingly strong. And so um, I've, I've learned so much from him and I've learned so much from all of you too, um, my Wiscott peers and thank you, Dr. Kandati and, um, and Sumathi, thank you so much. And to the IDF too. Um, I, I'm not sure if it was an IDF message board that I had um, accessed at the beginning. It probably was in 2005, um, but um, I, I thank you all. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you for taking the time to share your story. And this, I'm sure this rings, I mean, is very close to the heart of everybody who's sitting here. All of us can relate in one way or the other to your journey and what you went through. And very happy that David is doing so well. And even the cardiologist has signed off on him. So let's go, let's go ahead and get started. Um, at this time, I would like to welcome our speaker today, uh, Dr. K Fabio Kindari. Dr. Fabio Kindari is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Head Physician in the Division of Immunology and Allergy at Lausanne University Hospital in Switzerland. Um, Dr. Kindari is also has decades of experience um, working with Wiscott patients uh, when he was at the NIH. He's also the Chair of the Wiscott Aldrich Foundation Scientific Advisory Committee and takes care of many of our children here. Welcome Dr. Kindari. Thank you, Sumati. Uh, thank you to the Inefficiency Foundation for inviting me uh, to be part of this event tonight or today for you. Uh, so, uh, as you know, we we get we speakers get a very clear guidelines for for this talk. So we have ten slides, twenty minutes, and uh, and the font has to be thirty. 30 fonts, so my slides are different from, from the usual, but, but it's, a, it's a good experience. Hopefully, hopefully this will, will teach me something. And, uh, and basically what, uh, what I'm asking to, uh, I'm asked to do is to talk to you in, in general terms about the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. And uh, I feel that many of you that I see here, you know, know all, all uh, that I'm going to say already, but, but hopefully I will go through this in, in those, uh, 20 minutes and then we can have a discussion on things that you are interested in. So a little bit of history, uh, the name of, of, the, of the disease comes from uh, two physicians uh, that uh, they were important in describing uh, the, the first few cases of, of this syndrome. And uh, one, of these diseases, one of these doctors was the Professor Alfred Wiscott that in uh, early in uh, 1937, he described a family uh, with three uh, brothers here. You can see child A, child B, and child C uh, that had a series of uh, um, clinical symptoms like otitis, rhinopharyngitis, and rhinitis. And these uh, are therefore uh, upper, respiratory, upper respiratory tract infections. They also had eczema, uh, all, of, all, of, all of them and uh, they had uh, bloody stools. And you see Dr. Dr. Wiscott in his charts uh, documented this, this uh, clinical presentation. Uh, Dr. Aldrich uh, was a, a pediatrician in, in, uh, in, in Minnesota and he uh, described a large family uh, with multiple generations affected uh, with with kids that had, as as he said in his uh, in his paper, uh, draining ears, eczematoides, dermatitis, and bloody diarrhea. As you can see here, if you look at this circle over here, uh, there are uh, the the affected uh, males are marked as a, as a, a dark square. You can see there are one, two, three four uh, affected kids and uh, in the in the following generations there are there are more what is important for dr aldrich uh, discovery or contribution is that he realized that only males uh, were affected and he, re, re, um, he basically in individual individual identified sorry uh, this uh, female here as the carrier and the founder uh, of this family uh, that, that, that uh, then passed the gene on uh, to, uh, 
to, to the following uh, generations. So these two doctors, uh, therefore, identify the first, the, the most common uh, clinical presentation of these patients, uh, that is, uh, there are thrombocytopenia, and therefore, tendency to bleeding, uh, eczema of the skin, and uh, susceptibility to infections, mostly uh, upper respiratory tract infections like repeated uh, otitis uh, and rhinitis, but also, unfortunately, more severe forms of infection like pneumonias. Nowadays, we know that uh, patients with Wiscott aldrich syndrome are also more susceptible than the general population to the incidence of uh, malignancy and autoimmunity. And we know also that there is a wide spectrum of clinical presentation of this disease from a mild uh, form in which only thrombocytopenia may be present all the way to a combination of severe presentations, severe complications, including uh, severe infections and cancer and autoimmunity. What we know also is that this disease is caused by, a, uh, gen by genetic mutations on uh, uh, the Wiscott aldrich syndrome gene that is located on the X chromosomes, and that's why all male uh, patients are affected. And that gene encodes for it protein that is called the Wiscott aldrich syndrome protein that you see schematized here uh, that has several different functions uh, that, have, that have to do in general, or you can say mostly with the cytoskeleton uh, rearrangement and, and, and uh, remodeling. If you think about this a cell, this each cell uh, of, our, of our body has a little skeleton inside, like our whole body has, a, has the full-blown uh, skeleton. The Wiscott aldrich syndrome is very important for that single cell skeleton uh, to function properly. The, single, the skeleton of the cells is very important for many, many different functions of uh, function of the cell, uh, including cell division, uh, cell communication, re response to uh, bacteria, uh, and, and this is why the, uh, the symptoms of the Wiscott aldrich syndrome are so very and, uh, and different. The uh, inheritance of this disease, as I mentioned already, is uh, X-linked. Uh, that means that uh, only uh, male patients will be affected and female uh, mothers and sisters may, uh, female mothers will be carried in, in, uh, uh, in most cases, although like the, Mrs. Mrs. McNally uh, mentioned that there might be the onset of mutations in the germinal cell of, uh, of a, a woman, not necessarily that woman uh, may be then for a carrier and susceptible to uh, generate more affected uh, patients. So here you see a typical family uh, with uh, a series of affected uh, patients uh, that have uh, mothers uh, that are carriers and sisters that are carriers, and, uh, and the uh, the ability to diagnose the 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 presence of of carriers is for, of course important because uh, provides for the ability of uh, possibility to do genetic counseling, but also uh, provides the possibility to follow medically uh, these women that uh, as uh, as you probably know they, they have been presenting uh, some problems. And, had problems uh, themselves. The clinical presentation I already mentioned a little bit. Uh, the the classical triad uh, is uh, the uh, presence of uh, uh, problems uh, with uh, due to to thrombocytopenia and therefore the uh, presentations with petechiae, bruising, and bleedings. Uh, eczema of the skin and infections are really the, the classical. Uh, the classical uh, features that bring these patients to medical attention. In addition, uh, it's common to see patients with enlarged uh, lymph nodes and that are sometimes only due to uh, hyperactivation of, of the immune system, not necessarily to be uh, a cause for, for concern in, in terms of a, of a malignancy, but unfortunately, autoimmunity and malignancy are also uh, common in these patients, especially in, in, uh, in older patients uh, that, that uh, go uh, after uh, the, uh, the age of, uh, of the adolescence.
In terms of uh, uh, biological markers, uh, the most common uh, finding are low platelet counts. Uh, you know, the definition of low platelet counts is uh, less than 70,000, but I'm sure that you that have been living with the disease know that 70,000 platelets are a very good number. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we, we deal, we and you guys deal with numbers that are much lower uh, very often. And one very specific characteristic uh, of this disease is this, these platelets, in addition to be low in counts, that are also small in volume. And therefore, the, the, the uh, ability of, of these uh, uh, cell, cells to do their job is, is, uh, is diminished also by that factor. In addition, uh, on, a, on a CBC, on a blood count, uh, one often finds a reduced lymphocyte counts, especially of the, uh, the, uh, the, lymph the lymphocytes, the lymphocytes of the class CD8. And we also find low uh, concentrations of uh, IgM uh, and high concentration of uh, IgA, immunoglobulin of the class M and immunoglobulin of the class A, and a reduced uh, uh, concentration of isohemoglutinins. Uh, often uh, we judge the, um, the amount of or the uh, the severity of the disease by looking at, at this biological uh, values. Uh, if if a patient show, uh, shows a low IgM and high IgA, uh, we know that there is already something wrong with the, with the immune system, and we can differentiate uh, patients with a very uh, mild form of viscod that is often uh, called XLT from a, a, a more classic form of viscod with an immune system that is affected. Here I show you a, a picture of these uh, platelets in, in the whisker alder syndrome. As you can see here, uh, the volume, uh, the size, uh, you can see here is much lower, it's much smaller than what you see in, uh, in, in a blood smear of a control patient, a control sample. How do we do? How do we make the diagnosis of the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome? Uh, the, the simplest way is really to go and see uh, if the protein, the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome protein, is made uh, by the cell or the cells of the immune system. And the easiest way is to do it by flow cytometry. Flow cytometry, you might know, is a technique uh, that is based on staining of the cells with, uh, with antibodies that recognize the protein and that make the protein fluorescent. And this is a, what the staining of the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome protein looks like in a control uh, sample. Uh, we always use uh, a, a uh, reference. Uh, so this would be unstained cells. And the blue line uh, shows you the presence of the Wiscott protein now in, uh, in basically all the cells of, the, uh, of this control. In, in Wiscott patients, you can have uh, different uh, findings. You can have a, a reduced but persistent uh, preserved presence of the proteins. You see there is a little shift. You can see a little uh, um, a little of this blue cur curve that differentiates itself from the cells that, from the unstained uh, sample. Whereas there are some patients are totally negative for expression, therefore are not able to produce any any uh, protein and, and they, sh they would show up like this with the two curves that are, that are superimposed. Uh, this is an important finding because there has been some correlation between the amount of protein that the patients can make and the severity of the disease. And, and in some cases, uh, decisions of uh, proceeding with the pulmonary transplantations are made also on, on this kind of a finding. Uh, as I said, flow cytometry is, uh, is the easiest way, is the fastest way to have a, a, an answer. Uh, it not, it's not available in all centers, uh, and sometimes a diagnosis is made by doing a Western blot analysis. And in this case, the, the theory is the same. Uh, we use antibodies that recognize the protein to, uh, to um, make it 
appear in this case on on a uh, on a membrane uh, on which the protein of the cells have been transferred and uh, by uh, by linking the antibodies to uh, a, a a substance that can be made fluorescence here also you can see uh, that the viscoprotein can be uh, evidenced or uh, identified in control cells and less so in in uh, among in proteins from the patient cells once once we know that the protein is missing or the protein is uh, the the amount of protein produced by the cells is affected of course the next step is to do a genetic analysis of uh, uh, of the sequence that codes uh, the sequence of the genome that, that encodes for the whiskot protein, and that is the most the most definitive form of diagnosing uh, the disease. But it's also the most uh, time consuming and also the more expensive uh, form of, of diagnostic. Uh, here, for instance, you can see that the control in this particular uh, sorry this. This series of peaks here are basically the, the letters uh, that spell out the, the, the gene that, that encodes for the, for the whisker protein. And if you look at this region of, uh, of, the, of the, the genome, you can see that this control has four Gs, or these are five Gs uh, that, uh, that encode for this particular portion of the protein. Whereas this patient here uh, has an, an, a, an additional G, so has an insertion of an additional gene that puts the uh, basically causes a, causes a misspelling of uh, of the protein, and therefore a uh, a uh, it causes the presence of a protein that is no longer the whisker protein, but something else that is not able to to perform its function. Now, in terms of medical management, uh, as it was mentioned already, uh, there are uh, possibility of managing uh, the uh, complications that the, whisk the whisker patients may uh, encounter uh, throughout their life. And of course, the being the, the infections, one of the most common uh, complications, one can uh, decide to treat as they come or in the, in the case of uh, an, in an increase uh, uh, frequencies of infection, uh, uh, we can uh, adapt prophylaxis uh, with uh, antibiotics, uh, antiviral, antifungal, depending on, on the, the severity and, and the kind of infections that this patient uh, may present. Uh, for what concerns the, the platelet problems, uh, it is possible to uh, provide some prophylaxis or also of the bleeding episodes uh, with uh, um, with uh, medications that increase the platelet counts. Uh, probably you have you have heard about uh, this thrombo thromboagonist uh, that, that that can be used, Promacta and. Uh, and uh, uh, the other one I'm missing on, on that right now. Uh, of course, one can go all the way to remove the basic cause of, of a thrombocytopenia in whisker patients, which, which is the spleen. Uh, the, the, as I said, the, the whisker platelets are abnormal in size, but also in, in shape, and they are recognized as foreign objects by the spleen, and they are removed as they pass by uh, the spleen's uh, circulation. Therefore, by removing the spleen, uh, it's it's very uh, common that a, a correction of the bleeding episodes occurs, uh, even though uh, removing the spleen is a is a serious uh, undertaking in because the spleen is a very important immunological organ, as you know. And of course, in, in, in the case where there are comp inflammatory autoimmune complications, one can apply the standard therapy for, for, for these uh, disorders that are usually uh, anti-inflammatory and, and immunosuppressant, but obviously in, in immune deficient uh, uh, disease, uh, applying immunosuppressant is always a, a, uh, a difficult undertaking. Um, among the curative options, uh, we already heard about uh, allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about gene therapy. Uh, the idea is that 
since uh, the the viscoelastic syndrome is a, a disease of the of the hematopoietic stem cell, if we are able to provide the patients with the hematopoietic stem cell that's not that is not that's not that does not carry the mutations in the whisker gene, uh, we stand the chance of reconstituting an immune system with cells that uh, are normal and, and therefore a normal immune system without, uh, uh, without the, the presence of the disease. Gene therapy is, a, is based on a similar rationale, only that the, the is basically an, an autologous stem cell transplantation in which uh, the the cells of the the cells of the of the patients are used to uh, are used and they are corrected and 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 therefore are able to reconstitute an immune system and uh, a, similarly to what a allogeneic bone marrow transplantation would do. Now I'm going to spend a little time to tell you about. The, the mechan or the yes the procedures that that are used to uh, perform a bone marrow transplantation and gene therapy uh, for a bone marrow transplant uh, as we heard from uh, from Mr. McNally we need a donor uh, the donor can be related uh, part of therefore part of the family of the patient or unrelated uh, if uh, can be found in the registry of bone marrow donors. Uh, the donor needs to be able to uh, provide his, uh, his bone marrow that, you, that can be taken uh, with a bone marrow harvest or through a leukophoresis of uh, peripheral, peripheral blood mobilized stem cells. And the cells uh, may need to be processed uh, depending on uh, the, the approach, the medical approach that, that is, uh, that is uh, utilized in the, in the different centers. And then they are infused into the recipient normally uh, after uh, the administration of uh, a chemotherapy treatment that is, that is uh, called, referred to as conditioning. This conditioning can be uh, can be high uh, intensity or reduced intensity con conditioning according again to the protocol they are uh, that are applied at the different the different centers uh, gene therapy is is Different in the sense that uh, the donor, uh, the recipient, is also the donor. So the, the, this, the, the is the the patient it's himself needs to provide the the bone marrow cells. So the cells are harvested uh, similarly as a bone marrow harvest or uh, through a leukophoresis, and uh, the processing in this case is is. Uh, 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 it, it requires the exposure of uh, the bone marrow cells to viral vectors, uh, therefore to viruses that have been modified to be able to carry the gene of interest, in this case, the Wiscott aldrich syndrome gene, and uh, viruses that are able to integrate that gene into the cell of the, of the, of the patient. And then this, these uh, cells are reinfused into the, the recipient that is, as I said, is also the donor. Also in this case, uh, after a, uh, a uh, administration of chemotherapy that usually is a reduced intensity uh, chemotherapy. Now, there is a long history uh, of uh, bone marrow transplantation treatments uh, for the Wiscott aldrich syndrome. And the first report uh, dates back to 1968 uh, when Dr. Bach and, and, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Wisconsin and his group treated a, a patient with Wiscott Aldrich syndrome uh, with a, from a, with a, a HL identical. Uh, with marrow obtained from an HL identical uh, sibling. In this, in this case, uh, in this procedure, the the pros include the, fa the fact that is there is a, certainly a potential for a complete uh, reversal reversal of the uh, of the disease, and a uh, since we we have this. Um, 
this therapy available since more than 50 years, we know that there is a lot of experience in this disease, in, in, this, uh, in this approach. And we also know that the, the, uh, the results of bone transplantations have improved over the years. And as you can see here, uh, the survival nowadays, uh, having, having the, uh, the right donor at disposal, uh, it, it is more than 90 percent. Of course, there are uh, cons uh, and, and mostly are, are due to treatment-related complications. Uh, even in patients that ha they have a full engraftment, uh, the, the, there is a 15% or so uh, possibility that uh, there will be a long-term autoimmunity uh, developing. Uh, the, the most uh, uh, feared uh, complication is, is graft versus host disease of the chronic kind. And uh, Dr. Uh, Mrs. McNally uh, described to you uh, and, and what is the acute graft versus host disease uh, that, uh, that has disappeared in David, uh, thank goodness. And, but there are forms that do not disappear that can really uh, create serious long-term problems for transplanted patients. And there are other sequelae uh, that, that can uh, come from the utility utilization of uh, and the use of chemotherapy and therefore organ damage that they can uh, they can uh, uh, they can follow the, the the therapy in terms of gene therapy uh, we all uh, we all connect and you all know the the pros uh, this is an autologous procedure so we don't have to look uh, for a for a donor each patient uh, will have uh, will have a donor available and uh, there is certainly the potential for the correction of, of, of all symptoms of the disease. Uh, this uh, uh, therapy is available uh, for uh, around 10 years now, and we know that uh, uh, it's, it's been able to correct uh, the, the symptoms in many, in, in a series of patients. Uh, also in this case, uh, we have a, a survival uh, that is very high in this patient. The patient that uh, died during, uh, during, during treatment were uh, very severe, uh, severely affect, uh, infected patients that uh, did not make it through the, the conditioning. Uh, the cons, of course, uh, is that this, this therapy is a relatively young form of therapy. We consider it still experimental, uh, is not widely available, uh, and we have a short follow-up. Uh, so uh, even though the, the results are, are very encouraging, uh, we have to uh, say that we don't know if uh, patients that have been treated and, and, and successfully treated with gene therapy, you know, will uh, will maintain uh, a, a, a corrected immune system, you know, uh, as long as we know uh, bone marrow transplanted uh, patients uh, do. And uh, I'll stop there uh, because this is what I was asked to do. Um, I'm sure there are uh, possibly questions uh, and uh, that that I may be able to answer. Uh, let's see. Would like yes. To know, is there any new test or method predicting the autoimmunity state of the patient, specifically for young adults, which according to the current knowledge are susceptible to these conditions? Dr. Notrangelo once showed some experimental mapping of the autoimmunity potential or something similar. Yes, uh, there, there are theoretical models that, that can be used, uh, and not only for WISCOT, but in general to, to follow the, the ability of uh, um, cells, specific cells of the immune system that are called the, the regulatory T cells to keep at bay uh, the, the, the autoreactive uh, T cells or the reactive B cells. Uh, whether or not that really gives us a reliable uh, predict predict uh, predict uh, or pre prediction uh, tool is is still uh, unknown. Certainly, for some diseases of those particular cells that are immunodeficiency that 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 uh, hate and uh, and. Uh, 
that, that uh, affect directly the regulatory T cells, the number and the function of those T cells predict the severity of the, of the disease and the, the, the severity of the, of the autoimmune disease or the autoimmune complications that, that may appear. For WISCOT, uh, I don't know that anybody has, has applied those tests in, in a prospective way to be able to say that this is uh, a tool that we may use, but uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Madarangelo is doing that kind of study that I'm not aware of. Um, there's a question from um, Heather that pertains to all carriers, and Heather would like to know whether um, carriers can have enlarged lymph nodes just as the Wiscott patients do. I've seen some, some carriers uh, that have this uh, large lymph nodes uh, with a, a follicular hyperplasia uh, diagnosis, uh, it's called. Uh, what we know about this, this uh, phenomenon is that uh, some of the B cells of, of WISCOT patients are able to uh, enter the lymph node and, and start a spontaneous uh, reaction like if they were being, had been stimulated by an infection, but this is a reaction that is, uh, as I said, spontaneous because there are no, there is no a, a de adequate control of uh, the proliferation of these cells. Uh, now, uh, those are most commonly known in, in WISCOT patients, but the same kind of uh, um, uh, immune dysregulation that sometimes we find in carriers uh, would, would have the same basis uh, that, that that the WISCO patients have and that then produce this uh, uh, follicular hyperplasia. And, and therefore, uh, that can be seen in, in, uh, in uh, carrier females as well. As I said, I've, I've seen one case that at the histology looked exactly like uh, what uh, we would see in, in a WISCO patient. So uh, the answer is, is yes, with that can be uh, can be due to the uh, to the inherited uh, mutated X chromosome. Uh, Bob has a question about whether there have been other people with um, Bob. You can state your question. I'm trying to find your question here. Have there have there been more cases of large multiple nucleotide revertent mosaicism like my 35 plus cornucopia been identified since 2006? Not, not that many. Uh, it, it is possible that once, once we describe that this can happen, people uh, have not been reporting them because once, unfortunately, uh, we, we have had this discussion before, when, once things have, uh, have been reported, they become less interesting for the general, um, the general uh, field, and therefore is, it becomes more difficult to report them and get them published. Uh, therefore, after, after we, we saw all your, uh, uh, all your fantastic uh, cap capacity of, of, of correcting yourself, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is, has been the, 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 the more extensive, uh, really, collection of, uh, of, this, of these possibilities uh, or evidence of this possibility. Uh, we have seen a couple of more reports of uh, single uh, revertants. Um, as I said, per perhaps it has become less, uh, something that is, that is less uh, important for the, for, the, for the literature and therefore uh, people that see it perhaps don't even report it anymore. One thing that we have to say is that there has been really no clear evidence that these revertants may change the, uh, the phenotype or the clinical presentations of they make it better. Uh, perhaps that is because there is one, also one reason why uh, this, this, uh, the, these reports do, do not come out because they, they have not been uh, um, linked to a a, a, a clinical improvement uh, and therefore they, they remain a, as a uh, as an observation uh, you know biologically uh, fascinating but uh, there's nobody has found a way to push that mechanism that 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 fixes the self's uh, two levels that can be high enough to make it a a therapeutic uh, tool 
Next question. Now that BMT is so much better, what are your thoughts on transplantation of XLT patients? Right. Uh, my thoughts is that one should think about it uh, when the situation uh, affects seriously the, the, the lifestyle of the patient and uh, really the lifestyle of the family. Uh, we, we know how difficult it is uh, for the family to be in and out from, from the hospital, to have the, the continuous worry that a, a severe uh, bleeding can, can happen, how uh, limiting uh, for, for a normal lifestyle of a boy this can be uh, limiting the the sports uh, type that, that can be that can, that can be uh, performed, uh, uh, and I've never forget a picture of two uh, young boys that at uh, at uh, what you call it uh, forget what you call it uh, at during the the lunch time in the elementary schools were not allowed to run in the and they were sitting looking at their their peers having fun so uh this this is something that is really heavily in, uh, is on on the hearts of all of us that they see these patients and sure uh, on the hearts of the family with with the transplant becoming uh less toxic and more eff effective that obviously changes a little bit the uh the the, the parameters of of uh, going for it for for perhaps an indication that i would not have uh, uh recommended uh, uh 10 years 15 years ago however uh this this uh, these good results are also uh, obtained in the ideal uh, situations, and therefore uh, centers where this 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 these transplants are done frequently, uh, donors that are ideal, uh, and therefore it really remains uh, really a case by case uh, uh, decision, and a, a recommendation would have to change uh, on on basis of what is the situation or the or the specific situation of the patient, the family, and the location, uh, geographical, geographical and, and political, and, and all that. But it's true that uh, perhaps there is one more, there is, there is a little bit more of, a, of a, an option uh, for, for a early uh, correction of, of XLT uh, nowadays uh, compared to 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Thank you, because that's always, and I think most of the people here, this that question will brings it home. Um, what other questions? What are your thoughts on what treatment path should someone who does not have a match choose for their child? Uh, so we are thinking about, I guess, a severe case. A severe. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, if, if there is not a match and, and gene therapy is available, but we know how difficult it to have access to gene therapy at, at this point, uh, I would think that gene therapy is certainly something that one needs to consider. Uh, and this is, uh, many, many of you were uh, attending the, the talk by Dr. Ayuti uh, last, last uh, two months ago. Uh, so you probably know that, that going for gene therapy in, in, uh, in most cases does not not uh, preclude a, a, a another a, a attempt at curative therapy with bone marrow down the road if gene therapy doesn't work. Uh, therefore, before going for an for a uh, match match related donor transplant or an upper identical transplant, I would certainly do everything possible to see if gene therapy would be available uh, to me. Uh, otherwise. Uh, it really, then it really depends on where uh, the geographical location of the patient is, uh, because there are centers that are able to uh, apply a, uh, a transplant from an NHLA, a mismatch, uh, identical donor uh, with low risk of uh, uh, of uh, um, 
toxicity and using uh, using depletion methods that that have been shown to be very successful in terms of uh, uh, engraftment and uh, and lack of uh, graft first source disease but again also this said these uh, these advanced or more modern uh, approaches are not available everywhere, everywhere or uh, centers do not have a large experience using this uh, this uh, method so um, it's possible depending on where i find myself that perhaps i would i would uh, opt for a mature lipid donor uh, rather than an upper identical donor that perhaps would take longer to find uh, and keep an upper, an upper identical donor as a last resort in case of an emergency need uh, for a transplant. So again, unfortunately, I think this is this are uh, I don't have an answer that, that can really be applied to all all cases and and depends where the the patient is and uh, the situations in terms of uh, severity of the disease how long uh, the, the the decision uh, how long we can wait to to make a decision and so on thank you we have another question from bob um, is splenectomy viewed as a less viable option than it used to be uh it's view a little less favorably now that uh, uh Tromopag and promacta are available uh, I, I think if there is no if the bleeding episodes uh, the bleeding the consequences of bleeding are severe and and uh, and uh, life threatening uh, one could certainly would certainly start with uh, these thromboagonists so these these molecules that are able to push the uh, the parent cells of of the platelets to make more platelets and and see if that can buy some time and and uh, and, per, and avoid the need for a for a splenectomy there is certainly the idea and that that has not changed that uh, if transplant or now a gene therapy will ever be a possibility for these patients we, we should do everything to to keep the spleen in the patients because that would be very important for the, the development of the immune system after after transplant so yes perhaps uh, one could nowadays one waits a little more before uh, deciding to do a splenectomy uh, and uh, and it, i think it, it it's it's a good sign of the progress of medicine that now has identified at least some some medicament some uh, drugs uh, that can that can be used uh, to help the situation while waiting for a definitive therapy it is true also that we have better antibiotics and, and a better knowledge of how to protect patients after splenectomy. So I, I, I do not discard the idea of uh, uh, doing a splenectomy in, in the cases where, you know, we have uh, exhausted other options. Do you know when GT will be available? Also, what is the state of gene editing? What is will, will be available? Do you, do you know when gene therapy will be available? Also, what is the state of gene editing? Editing. Okay. So gene therapy, you know, all the trials that you can find if you go to, to on clinicaltrial.gov and you put in gene therapy, Wiscot, you see there are there are trials that are uh, open but not recruiting. Uh, and that means that uh, uh, I, there is really not known when, when gene therapy will be available. Uh, I think it is... It, uh, it, be, it, it, it will depend uh, from the uh, approval of this form of therapy by the FDA in the in uh, in uh, in the U.S. and by and, and when companies that now basically monopolizes this this form of therapy will allow the centers to use uh, their vector. So. The, to the question when will be available uh, it, unfortunately and what really it's a little irritating it, it's available now it's just not uh, made uh, it's not practically uh, applicable and uh, I think uh, uh, again if I if I were uh, in, the, in the in in the situation of needing I, I would basically call these people every day until until they would give me the, the opportunity to to take advantage of this um you know i 
I will admit that I don't know anything about uh, company policies and and uh, and strategies. But there might be a very good reason why this is going the way it is. Uh, but from a uh, ignorance standpoint, you know, it, it seems like you know something more could could be done. Um, gene editing uh, is certainly a uh, something that is progressing and uh, not as not as fast as it would want to uh, but there are there have been experiments in in the mouse model that that have shown that it's possible to precisely correct the mutation uh, occurring in in a patient and uh, uh, and and basically uh, reconstitute an immune system and 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 platelet numbers uh, that are protective uh, from from bleeding. Uh, the mouse is not a good model for for that. Uh, compartment or for that part of, of the of the disease. Therefore, uh, certainly we would have to have a little, something a little more solid to say that gene editing is able to to correct the thrombocytopenia as gene editing gene therapy done by gene addition as it is right now uh, has been able to. Uh, but of course, gene editing uh, would remove perhaps once for all this, this uh, concern that we have that uh, viral vectors that carry the gene into the cells may end up uh, destroying or this uh, dysregulating other genes that are, that are important for maintaining cells in their normal state and, and not becoming uh, tumor cells. Therefore, uh, there is still a very good reason even in the presence of a efficient therapy uh, based on, on gene addition, there is certainly a lot of reasons to be continuing to push on, on, uh, on, on gene editing. Uh, gene editing now can be done uh, the, 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 the initial way uh, through which we were doing gene editing was by uh, cutting the DNA nearby the mutation and then inserting a, a full uh, stretch a full stretch of dna that uh, corrects the, the mutation uh, there are and that is done with this molecule that you may have heard of is the, the crispr uh, cas9 uh, technology now we have the ability uh, there is there is uh, uh, there are ways that they allow us to really change only a specific uh, mutation into uh, the, the normal sequence, uh, which would be much more efficient because we don't need to provide a, an additional DNA uh, segment that needs to, needs to find its position, in, its, its proper position in the, in the genome of the cells. But uh, the this cut that this uh, this uh, gene editing molecules would provide would make would in uh, at the same time also provide the correction uh, and therefore uh, again there is there, there is a lot of enthusiasm and excitement about this new uh, this these new uh, technologies uh, base editing and, and prime editing uh, they are called uh, the efficiency is still low. But in diseases like immune deficiencies, uh, where we, we expect a selective advantage of, of the gene corrected cells over the non corrected cells, uh, this is the perfect uh, the perfect scenario where to try and develop these diseases. So hopefully, well, even though I don't I don't know that anybody has has gotten so close to a clinical application uh, of this, I, I think that there is enough work there that uh, that something will will come up uh, fairly soon. Uh, that's great to hear and fingers crossed that this is available for our children soon. Yes. Um, we have a question from Bob is is post transplant cyclophosphamide BMT looking like a better way to do transplants now? From from the the centers and, and the transplanters that do, that do it, yes, that's that's their their impression, and and we all have seen uh, results uh, with, with this treatment that, that with this approach that are really fantastic. So uh, yes, I think again, uh, that also is is a matter of uh, experience and and uh, numbers the numbers of transplant that have, that have been performed, and, and therefore. Uh, given that is 
it's, it's not a very it's not in in very very novel approach it's, it's already now it, it's uh, it's several years that it that is available so i think the centers have, have had the time have the time to to try it uh but not all centers i'm sure that have, have had a, a long experience and in, in, in long numbers or you know uh extensive numbers of of, of treatment especially in in wiscott uh therefore again uh there i would have a a, a a good discussion with with my transplanter and i would ask a hard question in terms of how many transplant has been done what has been which diseases and which which conditions have been treated uh, what what have been the uh, the the results and and, and the, the consequences so uh, but yes that that is certainly something that was not available 10 15 years ago and and uh, uh, it, it feels good to know that, that, that there are improvements like this that can come up and, and therefore there may be other things uh, in, in, even in the transport field, like in, in the gene therapy field that can make that treatment uh, perhaps more uh, more more appealing uh, for, the, for the people that are you know risk ad, uh, adverse uh, and they, they, they would perhaps wait for gene therapy because we know that in you know, all consider all uh, all things equal uh, gene therapy provides a, a, a less of a risk of a of a uh, of a toxic uh, effect thank you very much dr kandari and we are at the hour now or we're at the half so we have to close would you like to say you know all all our families would you like to say something to all of us in closing for for from my part, you know, I, it is always a pleasure to be in your presence, in your company, all of you that that that, that know me and, and, and that I know. So I would never, you know, uh, turn down an opportunity like this. Uh, so I just wish you good health, and uh, until we see you again. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kendari, and thank you to all of you who've been here today. And uh, thank you to Immune Deficiency Foundation for hosting the session and um, giving us the opportunity to learn so much about WSCAD. Thank you so much.